If you would join me at Romans chapter 6 this morning. And I'm going to do something that I, 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 uh, I don't normally do. I normally kind of stay in a spot when I'm preaching in, in the Bible. I'm going to read a text in Romans. And it's a, there's a verse that the Apostle Paul wrote. He wrote Romans. And he makes a statement in Romans that he actually writes or wrote a, almost a commentary on that statement. And the commentary that he wrote is in 1 Corinthians. So I'm going to be reading from Romans, and then I'm going to go over and preach Paul's commentary on what he said in Romans. Does that make sense? A commentary is a book that helps you understand the scripture. And he, he Paul also wrote the letter to the Corinthians that I'm going to read from, and he explains a statement that he makes. I want to read from Romans 6, and oh, I'll just begin in verse 1. I was going to read just a couple of verses, but let's begin in verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Let me tell you right now, I am so thankful I was born in the New Testament days. And I'm so thankful for God's grace. And by the way, even in the Old Testament days, that's still the same way people got saved was through grace. Verse 2, by no means, we are, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Jesus, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now I'm at verse five and this is where Paul makes a statement that I really want to focus on today at verse five and six. He said, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. And I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, no longer slaves. We are no longer slaves to sin. Now you won't understand that if you don't understand that the consequences of sin is always death. And when he says we are no longer slaves to sin, that means that death has been conquered and it has no sting in my life anymore because he lives. I will live also, and so will you. Amen. Let me say a prayer. Father, I thank you for your presence in this place, and I pray that you will bless the reading of your word and anoint me your servant to speak your message to your people and open our ears to hear and receive what you, Holy Spirit, would say to us, and let us be changed and sanctified by the power of your word and your spirit, and it's in Jesus' name we ask this. And everybody said, amen. 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 I, uh, if you want to follow along, I'm going to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And this is where Paul, in writing to the Corinthian believers, he expounds on what he said in Romans chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, that we will have a resurrection like his. We, we have a resurrection like his, and we're no longer slaves to sin. And he expounds on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And there is a verse in the Bible in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, it's verse 19 where he says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And I kind of like the way the King James Version puts it here. He said, We are of all men most miserable. And so I'm not miserable this morning. Are you? I hope you're not. Uh, I remember when Easter was a big deal as a, as a little boy, and I'm about to give my age away as I talk. I'm just thinking as I'm about to tell this story, I'm thinking, Todd, you're going to give your age away. 
But used to, you know, around Easter time, it, there was something that would take place every year that particularly little boys did not enjoy. And that was uh, clothes shopping. And we would all have to go get a new suit and a new tie. And you can see I'm not even wearing a tie anymore. I have been set free. I'm no longer a slave, a slave to neckties. I started to wear a tie for Easter, and I thought I'll be the only one in that place with a tie on. And uh, I wore my good jeans. But my, my mom and dad used to take us down to the clothes store, and which was usually you know J.C. Penney or one of those stores. And we'd buy a new suit, and and back then I can still remember one of my Easter suits. And y'all are don't 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 laugh too much at this, but one of my favorite Easter suits was a green plaid kind of jacket, sport coat that it was green and white, and it matched my white pants, which matched my white shoes. And so you can get an idea just about what year this was. And you can just about bet how those white pants worked with a boy like me. I mean, it wasn't long. I had stains in the knees of those pants from, from playing football, I think, after church um, outside. And, but it was kind of a big deal. And we would all, you know, have these, the Easter eggs. You would have the smell of vinegar that would fill the house. And then we would eat hard-boiled eggs, which I didn't even like back then. And then we would eat egg salad sandwiches for a couple of days. And, and that, was a, that was the thing. But everybody came to church on Easter. Even people who don't go to church would come to church on Easter. And it, we even created a saying for them. We called them the EC Christians, which was Easter and Christmas. And, and the, you know, and the, it, we get a little chuckle out of that. But Easter was a big deal. Well, I've come to tell you something. It's still a big, big deal. Because if it wasn't for what happened today, then we wouldn't even be here. And we wouldn't have any hope for anything that's to come. It is still a big deal. There is an empty tomb in Jerusalem that absolutely turns your life around and changes everything. It is the heart of the gospel is the fact of the resurrection of Jesus. And in 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> Paul explains in detail what he references in Romans chapter 6. He explains in detail the fact of the resurrection of Jesus and what it was like and the fact that because of that, it's going to affect your life and my life. And so he gives a lot of detail in this and I want to give some detail uh, to you. And I want to start by talking about the fact that we have a resurrection like his and what that means and the fact that we don't have to be of all men most miserable. So let me read in 1 Corinthians 15 and I'm just going to do a little reading here and, and bear with me. I don't usually read a whole lot when I'm preaching. I'll read what I need and preach on it. But I'm at verse 1, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you which you received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you were saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. And he said, what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Everybody understand, this is the most important thing about the Christian faith. Because without this, nothing else about our faith matters. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now, a lot of skeptics would say, I don't believe that. But Paul goes on and he says, and after he was raised, he appeared to Cephas and Cephas is just another name for Peter. And then he appeared to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still alive. As he was writing this letter, most of those people were still alive, though some had fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. He appeared to Paul 
on the road to Damascus. For I am the least of the apostles, he said. And go down to verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? Now, let me explain something about this miserable lot of people. In fact, one translation actually uses that word, that, that we are a miserable lot. You see, Corinth is a Greek city, and Greeks just didn't believe that anyone could die and then be resurrected from the dead and live again. To them, it just seemed impossible that someone could die and be brought back to life in a body because bodies just don't do that. I mean, if you or I saw a dead body just all of a sudden, poof, come to life and stand up and look at us and go, hi, how are you doing? We would pass out. We would wonder what in the world is going on. Well, some of this Greek thinking had infiltrated the church. Their ideas about the dead not being raised, the, the church had started to buy into this way of thinking that maybe Jesus died for our sins, but he didn't really come back to life again. Well, if he didn't come back to life again, then he didn't die for your sins. And so... Keep in mind that as Paul is writing this letter, what strikes me about this is who Paul is. I'm, I've studied the life of Paul, and, and Paul, not too long ago before he wrote this, was a man who firmly believed that Jesus was just a dead man buried in Jerusalem. And Paul knew that the doctrine of the resurrection not only had some serious doctrinal implications, and by that, I mean, if, if he didn't rise from the dead, then his death means nothing. We're, we're still lost and undone and un we're not saved before a holy God. Serious doctrinal implications. But secondly, he knew that it had some very practical implications for your life and my life right now, how we live and what we do and how we deal with things. And so he said, I've got to head this off right now. I've got to deal with it head on and. And so beginning with the doctrinal implications, he addresses the issue by raising the question, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? Now, here's Paul's logic. First of all, if the dead are not raised, then even Jesus is not raised from the dead. You understand that Paul is saying if there's no resurrection, Jesus is just a dead man buried in a tomb in Jerusalem. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. And more than that, we're false witnesses about God because he, because he said we've testified about God that, that he raised Christ from the dead. And if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is futile. And he said you are still a slave to sin. And if you're a slave to sin, then death is certainly going to be the end result of you. Gets even worse. If the body of Jesus was still laying in a tomb, then everyone you know who has died in Christ are lost and they have no hope beyond this life and we will never see them again and that affects every one of us. And Paul paints a picture of the utter hopelessness that we all face if in fact there's no resurrection from the dead. He says, if that's the case, you've believed in vain. And I want you to hear that word, vain. Paul is saying that if there's no resurrection from the dead, then everything about your life right now is all vanity, meaningless, worthless. Nothing matters if death ends everything. It doesn't matter what we do, doesn't matter how we live, doesn't matter where we live or what we have, if death is the end of everything, if all we have, if the only hope we have in Christ is just a little inspiration for a few short days, then we are, as one translation says, a pretty sorry lot. We're of all men most miserable. And there is a whole generation of people 
who've grown up in this country, most of whom do not know the truth about what happens at the end of this life. And if you don't know what happens at the end of your life, then you won't have hope. I've lived long enough in this world, I've already given away a little bit about my age by my Sunday suit. And I've lived long enough in this life to know <clears throat> that there is no hope in this life. Just what this world has to offer, I mean, all of the, all of the things that we can hope for is really meaningless and vanity if this is the end. And, and to the generation that has failed to understand that there's something beyond your last breath on this earth. I want, I want you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul this morning. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That means there's something beyond your last breath on this earth. And if you don't have a lot of hope right now in your life, you need to get a hold of the reality of the risen Lord because that's where hope comes from. He said, you've taken your stand on this. You see, Christ is raised from the dead and since Christ is raised from the dead, so will we be raised from the dead. And that's why some people, for some people, life is just a bunch of vanity. That's why they... They can't deal with tomorrow. That's why that for some people, they don't have any inspiration to go out and work, make something of themselves and do something with this life. I mean, if I'm just gonna work to, for nothing, then why would I do that? Well, because I'm working for something. You say, what do you mean? You, you, you pastor, you work? Yeah, I've got a boss, but I've got a bigger boss. I don't live my life for just the here and now. I live my life for the hereafter. And that inspires me to be something and, and, and make something out of my life now because I know that, that there's something beyond this life. Do you understand that I know Jesus lives not because I read it in a book. <clears throat> in fact, you can pick up on this in Paul's explanation of what he said, that we have a resurrection like his Paul is saying, I, I, I didn't read this and go, well, I think I'll believe that. He said, I was riding down the road one day to Dam of Dam toward Damascus when the risen Lord appeared to me in this swirling light that blinded me. And he said, why are you persecuting me, Paul? And he said, I asked him, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus. And so I know he lives not because I read it in a book, but because I've experienced the risen Lord in my life as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he came into my heart and he changed my life. And I know he lives because he lives in me. That's why when Paul said, you know, our body, our tent is wearing out, he likens it to a tent and he said, I don't grieve like other people grieve. He said, I know it's going to wear out. And so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that's sown perishable is going to be raised imperishable. It's going to be sown in dishonor, but it's going to be raised in glory. It's going to be sown in weakness and raised in power. It's going to be sown a natural body and raised a spiritual body. I mean, what is that? That's the words of a man who has hope beyond this life. He said, flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So he goes on to explain, secondly, the fact of his resurrection and how that should change the way we live. So let me, let me talk about the way we live in light of the fact of the resurrection of Jesus. And, and for this, in verse 4 of Romans 6, this is where Paul said, He said that uh, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may, listen to these words, live a new life. Let me just ask, you don't raise your hand and don't elbow your neighbor. Are you tired of your life? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Jesus came to give you a new life. And if you're not tired of your life, keep living it. You'll get there. 
Because I've lived long enough in this world to go, you know, I'm kind of tired of this. I've experienced enough life in this world to go, this is just not it for me. There better be something more. And Jesus says, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And Paul said, because he lives, we can have something he called a new life. Now, he goes on to elaborate in 1 Corinthians 15. You can follow along. I'm going to read starting at verse 29. He says this. Now, if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? This is going to sound a little odd to some of you if you've never read this. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? I just want to tell you right now, we don't baptize you for the dead. And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Because he said, I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained if the dead are not raised? And then he quotes from the Old Testament, let us just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Boy, that's the philosophy of a lot of people and how they live their life. He said, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good morals. He hasn't changed subjects. He's talking about how you live your life in light of the resurrection. Bad company corrupts good morals. I wasn't even allowed to hang out with some people. My mama wouldn't let me. He said, come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. And I say this to your shame. Now, if you've ever wondered how this world or our country has gotten so bad and so evil, I would say it's because there's a generation of people who've never gotten a hold of the fact that Jesus is alive. The doctrine of the resurrection or the fact that there is a God and a kingdom of God to inherit. And so people who have never gotten a hold of this they don't have anything else to live for except for what they have in this life. And so Paul gets real practical explaining the implications of the resurrection to the life you and I are living right now on earth. And let me just kind of break this down. There are three areas of your life that it ought to affect. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died for your sins and that he rose on the third day, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. If you believe that he is alive, these are three areas of your life that should never be the same again. It ought to affect your life. The first area, in fact, let me just give them to you, and then I'll talk about them, is evangelism. Second area is suffering and how you deal with it. And the third area is your morality. Now, those will preach themselves. I shouldn't even have to preach them, but I'm going to because it's fun. First of all, evangelism. I'm talking about reaching the lost. He said, if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? I will never forget this scripture. You know why? Because when I was in seminary, I had to write an exegetical paper on this passage of scripture. And I didn't get the grade that I thought I deserved at the time. And if my former professor is watching our television program, <laughs> I still love you, man. So I've had a lot of time to think on this and study this and, and kind of get better acquainted with this passage of scripture about the baptism for the dead and what that means. And some have suggested, I still think I should have got a better grade. Some have suggested that Paul is referencing a proxy baptism where a believer is baptized on behalf of a dead relative so that they too will be saved. Now the theological term for that in the Greek, I think, is hogwash. <laughs> 
That is, that, is, that is absolutely an unscriptural doctrine because, first of all, salvation in the Bible is a personal matter. God said, let each work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. I can pray for you. I can't do your praying for you. I can tell you about Jesus and what he wants to do in your life, but you got to make that decision yourself. So that's not what he's talking about here. One of the best explanations I've ever found for the baptism of the dead scripture is a theologian that I have, I've read so many of his books and he, he kind of, you know, my preaching philosophy, keep it so simple, a child can understand it and maybe the adults will catch on. <laughs> and that's kind of his, I think, approach as well. And he explained it like this. He said, the phrase probably means baptized to take the place of those who have died. In other words, he said, if there's no resurrection, why bother to witness and win others to Christ? Why reach sinners who are then baptized and take the place of those who have died in their sins? If the Christian life is, is only a dead end street, he said, get off it. But the fact is that because of the resurrection, I want you to hear me, everybody, Every person who lives on earth will share in the resurrection. They're either going to be a part of the first resurrection at the rapture, or they're going to be a part of the second re uh, re resurrection after the millennial reign. Everybody on your friends list, every contact in your phone, everybody you know will one day spend an eternity in one place or the other. C.S. Lewis said that, that one must keep pointing out that Christianity is a statement which, if false, is of no importance, and if true, is of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. What I am telling you from behind this pulpit is, is either of the most important truth that you've ever heard in your life, or it is of no importance at all. And that's what Paul is saying here. That's his argument. And if you truly believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, you will you'll keep telling your friends you need to accept Jesus as your Savior. Amen. The second practical effect on your life that it has has to do with suffering. And, and really, I'm talking about how we deal with suffering. And I'm just going to tell you, this one hits all of us. You can, you can reject the part about salvation if you want to, but salvation affects all of us. If you have never suffered in this life, you're a baby. Just, just keep living. It's coming. Suffering is coming. Like a freight train, it's coming because we live in a fallen world. I've, I've, been, I've lived my life long enough to, to know something about suffering. And, and Paul here is not talking about dying to self. When he talks about dying, he's talking about literal threats of death because of his faith. When he talks about fighting wild beasts at Ephesus, he's not talking about bears and lions. He's talking about people who want to kill him because he's standing up and saying, Jesus is alive because I talked to him on the road to Damascus. And, and so you understand, I've lived long enough to, raise your hand if you've ever suffered. Anybody? I just want to make sure, I love these unanimous votes we have in the church. Everybody suffers. But Paul says that if you believe that Jesus is raised from the dead, I want you to understand exactly what, he's, what he means by all of this. He's saying that, that death is conquered, the sting of death is removed. That means everything, do you understand that everything that you suffer in this life is going to be ultimately conquered through the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Whew. Man, I'm glad to know that. That's why he was able to say, our, our light affliction. I read that in the Bible where he talks about the suffering we go through in this life, and he calls it our light affliction. It's but for a moment. I'm, and, you know, as a young man, I'd read that and go, Paul, come on, give me a break. Don't you know? Man, this, is, this life is hard. 
And Paul, but Paul explains the reason he can say it's, a, it's just a moment and it's a light affliction is because death is not the end of it all. Life is. Eternal life, the resurrection, there's more to this story than the end of my life. Amen. And then the third practical area this affects is morality. He said, you know, Paul, was, he didn't mince words. He said, some of you are just ignorant about God. Have you ever, have you ever had people try to argue with you about your faith? I'll tell you, I'm one of the... I, Probably shouldn't boast of that. I started to say I'm one of the best arguers there are. That's probably not something to boast about. I've had conversations with atheists. I had a conversation with an atheist one time when I was in college in the, in the old library over here on campus. And we got into a conversation and, and must have lasted, I don't know, an hour, 10, I don't know, a long time. And he finally had to go. And he got up and started to walk away. And he turned around and he looked at me. He said, I want to tell you something. I'm going, here we go. He said, I want you to know I've had many conversations like this with people who say they're Christian, and this is the first time I've walked away that I wasn't mad. I said, well, I don't want you to get mad. That would defeat the whole purpose of my argument. I said, I love you, man, because Jesus lives in my heart. But, but Paul said, some of you are ignorant of God. And, and he said, if you, if you weren't ignorant of God, he said, you know, he, he said, some people just say, well, you know, since there's no resurrection, let's just live life. Let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. If death ends all of our suffering, then we might as well live life however I want to live life and do whatever feels good. And boy, that's a pretty selfish mindset, isn't it? And some people wonder why they're so miserable. Because you're living life for you. Because you don't understand that there's more to life than just you. The world doesn't revolve around you. There's a creator. He is God. He is sovereign. He created all things. He created you. And he has a plan for your life. And he wants you to know him. And so Paul says, this God has a moral standard. I've, I don't know if it's just me and I'm getting older. But it seems to me that morals have changed in our culture. I mean, we used to know right from wrong. It was pretty simple. And we've, we've so convoluted it that we now, things that, that are, ought to obviously be wrong, we say they're right. And things that are obviously right, they say that's wrong. We used to teach morals in school. I mean, schools, public schools would teach morals to little boys and little girls. There were schools in this country who would teach right from wrong. And now we have schools that, I don't know, they don't even want to teach little children that they are little boys and little girls. And in this country, it seems that immorality is just no longer a, a thing to be hidden behind curtains of shame. It's embraced. It's put on public display. And Paul says, if you believe that this is true and that Jesus is raised from the dead, then it ought to, it ought to affect your morals. I just want to remind you, morals, good morals are not bad, people. Good morals are what makes civilization civilized. It's what makes our, our community worth living in. And Paul said, if you believe it, that those three areas of your life will be affected by your belief of the resurrection. And then lastly, I want to get to the no longer slaves part. God is a holy God. He cannot just forgive a sin. There has to be a payment for it. I've explained this before. God is just. God is righteous. God is holy. These are God's attributes. If God is not those things, then he's not the God we need, right? God is just. If you went before a judge because your neighbor stole your car and wrecked it and totaled it, and you went before that judge and that judge looked at your neighbor and said, you know, I'm just going to forgive you. 
you would say, well, that judge is not a just judge. That's why God can't just look at a sinner and say, you know, I forgive you. There has to be a payment for that, for him to be just. That's why when Adam and Eve sinned and they became aware of their nakedness and they clothed themselves with leaves, they still felt naked. That's why they hid themselves when God came down in the garden and said, where are you? They said, well, we were hiding because we were naked. And he said, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree I told you not to eat of? And it wasn't until God sacrificed animals. There had to be a death because the the results of sin is death. And he sacrificed those animals and took the skins of those animals and God clothed them. And only then were they clothed. So there had to be a payment for sin. And the consequences of sin is death. I've stood, as I've been a pastor for 38 years, and I've, man, I've been with many of you and your families at the funeral home or around the graveside. And, and Paul writes about this in, in 1 Corinthians, and I've read from 1 Corinthians in so many of your lives, starting in verse 35, about the resurrection of the body. Remember, he said, we have a resurrection like his. This is not just going to be the resurrection of your spirit or your soul. Your body is going to be resurrected, just like Jesus' body was resurrected. He said, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. He explains how that's foolish. What you sow doesn't come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you don't plant the body that will be, but just a seed And then he uses an analogy of wheat or something. He explains how the body is going to be resurrected. So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. I'm in verse 42. The body that is sown is perishable. It's raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And there, he said, if there's a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. He goes on in verse 54 and says, when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, because we are no longer slaves to sin. And because we're no longer slaves to sin, we're no longer slaves to the consequences of sin, which is death. I'm going to tell you something. This affects all of us. I don't know if you've noticed, but they've done studies on this, and apparently uh, 100% of people die. And we live our life giving little thought to the fact that one day you'll breathe your last breath. I mean, when I was young, I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I did so many dumb things that should have killed me. I look back on my life, my brother and I, back in our day, we were just kids. They'd give us a 22 and say, go out in the woods and come home sometime after dark and be here for dinner. And I'm like, what were our parents thinking? But the older I get, the more I realize that this life is temporal. That one day this life will end. Death is certain. And Paul said, because Jesus is raised from the dead, so will we. Because we have the same resurrection that he has. And one day, you're going to read in the paper that Todd Steffi has died. Maybe. Maybe you'll be alive then. Don't believe it. I'll be more alive than I have ever been. I got to get to the therefore. Paul, when he's explaining this 
statement he makes in Romans when he's writing his commentary to the Corinthians explaining all this resurrection stuff. He couches it in, in parallel statements. At the beginning, he, he, he begins with, stand, take, take, you've taken your stand on this doctrine. And at the very end, he repeats that. Therefore, after he explains it, therefore, take your stand. Stand firm. And they're like bookends that holds this doctrine in place. And I've got to get to the therefore in the last part of this chapter, verse 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm on what? The doctrine of the resurrection. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Therefore, here's the therefore. Anytime you see the word therefore in the Bible, you need to look and see what it's there for. It's connecting what's about to be said with what I've been saying. I've been telling you about the resurrection and what it means in your life, your morality, how you live, how you deal with suffering. Therefore, because of the fact that Jesus is raised from the dead, therefore, here's how you take your stand as you live your life in this earth. And, there, and there's just three things I want you to see. Let nothing move you. I, I, don't, I don't know if you know this, but boy, this world is shaken. Things are so uncertain. But I've got news for you. Nothing really moves me anymore like it used to. Why? Because I've got my head wrapped around the fact that Jesus is alive and because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Secondly, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. The most important thing we do is what we're doing right now. Coming to church and getting closer to the Lord and letting him work in our lives and then going out and sharing that with our friends. Always giving yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. And thirdly, because you know that you labor in, your labor in the Lord is not in vain. There's that word again, vain. Vanity, meaninglessness. Everything you live your life for, if you believe this, is not in vain. Everything I live for has a purpose. And everything I go through in my life has a purpose. Paul told us, you know, interestingly, the doctrine of the resurrection was kind of a, uniquely a New Testament doctrine. It was, was not part of the Orthodox Jewish theology of the Old Testament. Did you know that? The Jews didn't go around preaching about the resurrection. In fact, by the time Jesus comes on the scene in, in the opening of the New Testament, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these two Jewish sects of leaders, were at odds about the doctrine of the resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the resurrection. That's how you remember that. So it, wasn't, it, it was not really a Jewish theological doctrine in the Old Testament, but interestingly, I believe there were some of God's people in the Old Testament who started to get this. One of them, going back to the oldest book in the Bible, a guy by the name of Job. Job suffered so much, not because he did anything wrong, but because he did everything right. He suffered and suffered and suffered. And here's what Job said. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. That sounds like a resurrection to me. He said, I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another. And he ends this with these words, how my heart yearns within me. I've got a yearning in my heart. The Apostle John on the island of Patmos 
had a vision of our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. And the Lord said to John, I am the living one. This is what Jesus said to John. I am the living one. I was dead. And now look, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and, and hell. The word there is Hades, which is the place of the dead. One of these days, every dead relative that you have that believed in the Lord is going to come out of the grave. And one day, every believer will be resurrected and we will live forevermore with the risen Lord. If you believe that, would you stand with me? And if you would bow your heads and no one looking around. And I just want to ask, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, but you want to today, I won't embarrass you, but if you'll raise your hand, I'll pray for you. And I'll, you can come talk to me after church. Yes, anyone else? All right. All right. I want you to come and see me when I'm done with this service, and I want to pray with you, but I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you for your good word, and I thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection. I thank you, Jesus, that you died for our sins. I thank you that you rose from the dead. I thank you that you live inside of our hearts and that you save us from sin, the consequences of sin. I thank you that we have a life like yours. We have a resurrection like yours. And I thank you that we are no longer slaves to sin or the consequences of sin. I pray a blessing over these people and I pray that your face will shine upon them and that your glory will be over them and I pray that your favor will be upon them and it is in Jesus name that we pray and everybody said amen.